All right, we are going to start a study here on deliverance, exorcisms, and the Bible. What does the Bible say about this? I did do a little frequently asked question thing um, on uh, what about casting out devils for today. The word is devils in the King James Bible. It's not demons. Um, there's good reasons for that, but uh, I've gotten into that in other studies, so I won't cover it here. But the thing of casting out devils, is it for Christians today? And they are, there are people that say, well, we have a deliverance ministry. We deliver people from, you know, these devils and things and cast them out and all this other stuff. Well, um, as a Bible-believing Christian, um, what you do is when somebody tells you whatever thing, you say, okay, well, let me look it up in Scripture. So if you look up the word deliverance, we're not going to go through the references. There are 16 references to the word deliverance in your King James Bible. Um 100% of the time, it refers to physical deliverance. Not once is it ever spiritual. Look it up if you think I'm wrong. It's always about, you know, God you know, gave him a great deliverance, you know, that he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt by a great deliverance. Um, there was a battle and he brought them through with a great deliverance. It's always physical. He's res rescuing them physically. Uh, there are no deliverance ministries in the New Testament, in other words. Hmm. Interesting. But yet you have people that have dedicated their whole life to deliverance ministry and exorcism. What about the word exorcism? Well, turn to Acts chapter 19. There is actually an exorc exorcism in the uh, uh, New Testament time. Again, understanding that the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 17, uh, talks about the New Testament coming in with the death of the testator. When Jesus dies on the cross, that begins the New Testament. The New Testament does not begin in Matthew chapter 1. It's very important to understand that. So the New Testament begins with the death of the testator, and then it continues on up through. So Acts chapter 19 is in the New Testament. Acts chapter 19, verse 13, let's read here. It says here, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priests, which did so. So there are seven of them. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it fifty thousand pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Okay, few points to be made here, definitely. <laughs> Um, these exorcists, were they saved or lost? Lost. They were trying to use the name of Jesus that Paul preached, and yet they didn't have that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the devil's in, the, in this manner going, I know who Jesus is, I know who Paul is, but who are you? Who are you to tell me? And I'm going to tell you, going to spoil a little bit of the surprise, because we're going to be looking at a lot of video today. Uh, did quite a bit of research for this study. Um, exorcism is a Roman Catholic practice. So why would you have professing Christians doing it? But we see here, exorcism in the Bible, the only one, the only time that the word exorcist, or exorcism or anything like that, the only time it appears, it's talking about a lost men, seven lost Jews. Rather interesting. And I find it interesting too. Verse 15, And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? Did the devils know your name? I've seen truly devil-possessed people. I've had a few experiences with them. <laughs> and uh, it's weird. I remember this one time I was at this uh, Renaissance Fair thing, and it was I had went in ignorantly. I had no idea. It was like October. It was right before Halloween, you know. And, and they are like, all this occultism, and I'm just walking around going, okay, this is really bad. And I remember there was this woman, 
and I'm about 99% sure she was a witch. And I remember she was just like, she just like got behind this pole in this tent and she was just like peeking around the pole at me and she was just like staring at me. You know, just like this, this impish like thing. And I could just feel that like, whoa, okay, yeah, devils. And there was a bunch of people that were doing that that I'd walk by and they'd be like, they, they just kind of, ugh. And I went to this grocery store the one time. This is another incident. And this guy was there and he had all these satanic tattoos. I mean, satanic symbols and, and occultism and stuff tattooed all over his body. And just huge, big guy. I mean, you know, could have pounded me into the ground, I'm sure. But I, I just walked up and I got like kind of beside him. And at first I, I wasn't like taking notice of the tattoos. And so I like walk up and I'm looking for something and I see him and he's like, he, he like got real uncomfortable and starts walking away like weirdly. And I like looked at him and I'm like, wow, he's got some really satanic tattoos. Well, he goes down another aisle and, and I kind of was like, oh, whatever. And I came down the other aisle and met him again later on in the store. And again, he's, and he, and he just like got really nervous and blah, 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 took off and got out of there. And I didn't, I didn't have any kind of thing on me identifying me as a Bible-believing Christian. I'm not carrying a King James Bible around. I'm just there, you know. You know, it's weird. And, uh, you know, I've had a lot of different experiences with people and, uh, that are possessed with devils. And uh, one of them, another little interesting story, uh, my former neighbor, at, uh, one, the, the property that we own, that I've talked about in other studies, was a Roman Catholic, and the guy was just a just a raging alcoholic. I mean, he was, I think he was only sober maybe uh, probably less than 10 times that I've known him or that I knew him. He's dead now and, and in hell. Um, tried to witness to him. He told me he'll never believe the way I do and he cussed me out and stuff. So sorry about that. But uh, um, I remember this one time I went over and he was just drunk out of his mind, you know, and he just slurred speech, and he's like, hey, you know, and he's like, I'm from Brooklyn, you know, and he kept saying, you know, hey, I'm, you know, he'd say his name, Tom Merrill, and I'm from Brooklyn, you know, how you doing, and he's just drunk, and just like that, he stops, and he goes, I know who you are, and he goes, you're a man of God, and he had this guttural, and his voice got crystal clear, no slurred speech, no nothing. I know you're a man of God. And he just had this real creepy look on his face. And I'm like, try, I tried to say some things to him and he, he wouldn't let me talk. And I was like, okay, I'm not witnessing to this guy right now. I mean, he's drunk. There's devils manifesting here. And I'm just like, okay, you know what? Whatever. I was like, all right, I got to get going, you know. And I left. And I thought to myself, I'm going to wait till this guy's sober. I'm praying for an opportunity to witness. And I finally got that opportunity, witnessed to him. You know, told him, explained the gospel to him. He cussed me out. And I was like, all right, you know, I'm still your neighbor. I'm going to try to do, you know, if you need help, I'll try to help you or whatever else. But you're going to hell. And a couple months later, he was in hell. So I have seen this thing of, of devils and they know who I am. A lot of times I'm not even opening my mouth. And you'll see that. When you're saved, when you're truly saved, you will you will get into confrontations and things get around people that are devil possessed, and they'll know you. They'll know who you are. They'll feel it. It's very interesting. But uh, interesting too in this passage. Notice it says in verse 17, "Fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified." Hmm. So people saw, hey, these devils, they know who Jesus is. And these false, you know, these aren't even saved Jews. And they just got beat up by this guy that had the devils in him. And uh, Jesus was magnified as a result. Well, that's part of the reason for this study here. I'm not doing this study to attack people and attack other people's faith and blah, blah, blah. No, no. I'm doing this thing because I'm saying devils are real. There are people that are possessed with devils. But this exorcism stuff is lost people. And I don't believe it's exorcism truly, actually exorcism where they're getting the devils out. I believe it's actually they're putting the devils in. I'm going to show you some proof of that in a little bit here. Video proof where I believe that these people are actually being possessed with devils. Because again, I'm going to spoil a little bit here, but remember, in the gospel accounts, when you see people that are possessed with devils, they are running and falling down before Jesus and worshiping him. 
and you'll see this in a little while when I play the videos, you will see these people and they have the devils cast out and they get done and they're going, and they'll start worshiping, oh, Jesus, oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, and they'll start to speaking in tongues. <laughs> dangerous, very, very dangerous. But uh, a couple more points I want to make here. Um, and this is also very important. What happens after this event? False exorcism, the name of Jesus is magnified, but look at this. Verse 18, and many that believed, say people, came and confessed and showed their deeds. They didn't have devils cast out of them. They're saying, hey, we have some things wrong with us. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. That's very, very telling. Okay? You see, this is what's really going on here. The reason that you will have demonic oppression or oppression things, I don't believe that a Christian can be possessed with devils. Okay? I don't believe that, that devils can get in there because you're washed in the blood. The Holy Spirit is residing in your body. So I don't believe a Christian can be possessed with devils. But oppression is definitely possible if and only if you have things in your home that allow the devil's legal rights to come into your life. Okay? I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. It shall not cleave to me. When you're watching television and, and movies and things like that, that stuff is cleaving to you. You are setting wicked things before your eyes. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it talks about abstain from all appearance of evil. It doesn't say from all evil. It says appearance of evil. So don't tell me, oh, it's just entertainment. No, it's not. No, it's not. And I used to be a very hardcore television movie addict. All right, I would literally go, I mean, I'd go to like the old video stores. They don't do this so much anymore, like Blockbuster Video and things. People do it online or, you know, they, they whatever, you know, you can get download videos and things, I realize. But you used to be able to go rent, you know, VHS tapes back in the old days. And I'd be there and I'd be just like any new movie that came out, I'd be looking and, oh, I, didn't, I haven't seen this one yet. So I was addicted to that stuff. And I can tell you, I wasn't saved at that point in time. I was a professing Christian, but I was not saved. But when I got saved, the Holy Spirit was just like, nope, stop watching that stuff. And I've seen other people, they get saved and it's just like, I can't even watch television anymore. This stuff's filth. It's garbage. It's, it's an insult to me. See? And what happens is, the reason you have oppression is not because there's some devil in your life that you can cast the devil of pornography out or the devil of gluttony or the devil of whatever. Uh-uh. It's your problem. It's not some foreign spiritual thing that comes in there. They, many that believed came and confessed. They confessed what? I confess that I've been persecuted by a devil all this time because seven generations ago there was human sacrifice and it's been bothering me ever since. No, 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 no. I don't think so. They confessed that they were doing wrong. They confessed that they had things in their life that was sin. And what did they do with it? They showed their deeds, first of all. Many of them which also used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. They burned them. If you have Hollywood movies in your collection, burn them. If you have rock and roll music, rock and roll goes back to voodoo, to Santeria, to uh, witchcraft, druidic witchcraft and things, the drum beats that conjure devils. Oh, but it's okay. I listen to the music for the, the, the quality of the guitars and the drums coming together, and I don't listen to the lyrics. Uh-huh, yeah, I've heard that before because it used to come out of my mouth. All right. Don't tell me that you can be a Christian listening to rock music and just okay with the Lord and the Lord's just not going to do anything. You are opening a door for devils to come in and oppress you. Don't even talk to me about it. And you're looking at things and wickedness and stuff like that, and that's causing you to fall for pornography. It's not that some devil came in, the devil of pornography or the spirit of Jezebel or something. Foolish nonsense. You're in sin, you better confess it. And if you have things in your home that are causing you to lust, that are doorways for devils, burn them. 
You say, well, couldn't I just sell them on eBay? I paid a lot of money. Like 50,000 pieces of silver? Burn them. Burn it. Okay? Why? Well, because it's giving the spirits that are attached to that stuff, it's giving them a little prelude of what's coming for them in eternity. That's why you burn it. And the Lord will do great things with your life. So you see, this whole exorcism system is phony. That's why the Catholics are doing it. Because, see, they don't want their people to think, hey, what you're doing is wrong and sinful. And I realize that there are some that do. I realize that you read the catechism and stuff like this. You go through the catechism and it's don't drink, don't watch bad things on TV, don't, don't cuss, don't fight, don't blah, 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 blah. But if you get the right priest, they're, they'll look the other way. As long as you give the right amount of money, you know. Sure, absolutely. Just like a Protestant preachers. And I know that there are Catholics out there that morally are pretty decent people. I know that they're not all child molesting, horrible, wicked people. I understand that. But your whole system is corrupt because you're basing your, your salvation on a continuing system of works when Jesus Christ finished salvation at the cross. Again, I've done studies on that. Catholicism is a false system. And that's why they come up with the thing of exorcism. And again, I, we're going to see it later on. There are priests that will fight amongst themselves whether or not exorcism should be part of the church, whether whatever, whatever. There's you know, a, an official system of exorcism, an exorcist, trained exorcists in the Catholic Church. And there are other priests that are like, yeah, I think that's kooky nonsense. There is warring within Catholicism. All right. But that's why I'm a Bible-believing Christian. So I don't have to say, well, you know, that priest does outrank the other priest. And, that, and he is kind of quoting the, the church fathers better and the, and the uh, canons and decrees. and the. So I guess I should believe that. No, no. What does the Bible say? Very, very important. So let me show you another very important scripture. We're going to go over some scriptures here and then we're going to get into the video evidence of this whole thing. I'm going to show you some pretty shocking stuff. And I'm going to be naming names. Get used to it. Matthew chapter 7. Another very interesting thing. You say, well, I believe in deliverance ministry. I believe in casting out devils. It's given to Christians. We're supposed to cast out devils. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Wait a second. You mean... There could be exorcists that cast out devils in Jesus' name, and yet Jesus doesn't know them? What do you have there? Well, first of all, they could be faking it, which I think is the case with most of them. We're going to see that later. Um, you can fake the whole thing of having devils cast out of you. You just change your voice a little bit, and you go into weird convulsions and things. Um, you can fake it. But secondly, I think that the devils also can play along. The devil could actually say, okay, I'm going to just kind of back off and say, oh, yeah, you feel better now, don't you? Yeah, here, let's praise Jesus. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. And then says, oh, hey, buddies, come on in. Let's, let's do this. And we're talking with lost people here, talking about lost people. I'm not talking about saved people. Saved people aren't going to have devils coming into them, all right? But you see it there. People are casting out devils in Jesus' name, and yet the Lord never knew them. And it, it amazes me. I see these people and they have these quote-unquote deliverance ministries and they're like, we're casting out devils and, and all this other stuff. And they're, they're just so spirit-filled because they cast out devils in the name of Jesus. And they say, I command you in the name of Jesus. You know, And they're, they're taking their crucifix and they're putting it up and stuff and they're taking the Bible and they're whacking the person on the head. You know, wingnut nonsense. And they're coming out with all this stuff and I command you. And, and then you see them and they're like, using NIV and, and, and they're into rock music and they're, they're doing all this other wicked stuff and they're covetous and they're all these other things and it's just like, <laughs> wait a second here. If you're the spiritual powerhouse that can just cast out devils, you know, 
Uh, wouldn't the Holy Spirit show you some other truth there? Crazy. But is there an actual casting out of a devil in the New Testament? Yes, there is. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. Here's an actual, real casting out of a devil. And you're going to see some very interesting things with this. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 18. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by sooth, sooth saying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, now look at this, These men are the servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul being grieved, turned and said, un, uh, said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Did she say anything wrong? No, she didn't. These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Let me ask you something, Christian. If some lost person said that about you, would it grieve you? It should. It grieves Paul. You know why? Because when you take the praise of lost people, when they're saying, hey, this ministry is great, this man is a great man of God, he's showing unto us the way of salvation. When you get uh, applause by the lost world, and you take that, and you use that, you're basically saying, I want the lost world's approval. I'm okay with the lost world's approval. We shouldn't be like that as Christians. And that's why from the very beginning of my ministry, I said, I will never take one cent from Google. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to take money from the lost world. I mean, if somebody sends me money and they say, I want to give this gift to your, to your ministry and they're a lost person and I'm not aware of it, I'm doing it ignorantly. I have no idea. You know, I get gifts from people and they say, hey, I really appreciate what you're doing. I want to put this money, money towards your ministry. Thank you. I assume that they're all saved. I have no idea. But it's a different thing entirely to monetize my account and let them promote my ministry. That's rather strange. I have some serious questions about people that do that. I mean, I don't follow any ministry that monetizes their account with Google. And I would ask anybody that you're watching, I would put that on them and say, are you making money from Google? Because if you are, I can't trust you. Why? Because our text says not to. Hmm. But again, notice that this woman, she is, has devils in her, and yet she is praising the Lord. Hmm. Very interesting. Now we're going to go and I'm going to show you some video clips and what we're going to do is we're, I'm going to go through these video clips and I'm going to pause them, you know, periodically and things and we're going to look at some arguments and things from scripture and I'm going to talk about some of this stuff. And then when we come back, we're going to uh, go over some more scriptures and then we'll be done with the study. But uh, you're going to see some rather shocking things in these videos. Um, most of it is going to be okay, you know, for most people, but if you have very small children, I would warn against that because there's some really, you know, kind of weird stuff coming up here, kind of graphic things. Um, so I would, I would, you know, tell little children maybe, you know, you want to go out of the room for this segment that's coming up here. Um, I'll leave it up to you as parents. Um, a lot of it's just mild and just, you know, exposing false doctrine. But watch it first as a parent, and then if you want your children to see it, you know, go ahead. So... I'm going to show you some video clips here. Let's check these out. All right, we're going to start out here with the very first video clip. Uh, this one is actually a Jesuit priest, believe it or not. And he actually goes into Greek and proves that Jesus never uh, performed an exorcism. Let's check this out. The word exorcizo. You know, it means I exercise you, I abjure, I command, I tell you, you must do X. 
It's a very, very strong word in Greek. And you'll notice in the Gospels in Greek, it is never used by Jesus. His word is a form of ekbalo, I drive out. This is important because the Gospels never say that Jesus exorcised anybody. So exorcism is going to be different from the way in which Jesus behaved in the Gospels. Why? Exorcism is something that a priest or deacon in the Roman Catholic Church does having power over spirits, evil spirits, demons, Satan himself, in the name of the victorious and risen Christ. Hmm. Exorcism is something that a Roman Catholic priest or deacon does from a Jesuit priest. So you see the SJ there, Society of Jesus, behind his name. Hmm. And I find it interesting, too, that it's a Jesuit practice to go to Greek and try to define words and whatever else. And I'm not talking about defending the King James and saying, you know, well, actually, if you look at the Greek word there, it means such and such, and that's why the text says it that way. It's perfectly translated. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people that are like, well, the Greek, and they always go to the Greek, and the Greek, actually, the Greek word here, and it gives such deeper meanings, and there's a Jesuit priest on it. But, of course, no Protestants would do that. Never, of course. But you see that there. I thought that was rather interesting. And by the way, the picture at the end there of the guy on the bed, and, uh, and there's a guy standing there and he's doing the exorcism, that's an old drawing of the founder of the Jesuit order, Ignatius de Loyola, or Ignatius, however you want to say it. Um, he did exorcisms. So the founder of the Jesuits was an exorcist. Huh. Rather interesting. But let's go on to the second video. And there would be very strong signs such as absolute abhorrence and fear of the Eucharist and particularly of the crucifix. This they would just be terrified of. Uh, mentions of saints or anything that would do, particularly the Blessed Mother. And the person's reaction is violent, extremely violent. We do not know why it occurs. We do not know how it occurs. We only know that it occurred. <laughs> you got all these Jesuits out there so screwed up in the head. We don't know why it occurs or how it occurs. We only know that it occurs. <laughs> these people, they get so muddled in their wording and their speech and they just, you know, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. The Bible says it's just like, <laughs> Jesuits. <laughs> That's cracking up. Sophistry. They're just always, you know, they say things that contradict and seem to contradict, and they don't, but they don't really contradict, you know. And it's... But notice that they said that people that are possessed with devils will have an extreme fear of the elements of the Holy Eucharist, the bread and the wine. They will be um, petrified of crucifixes, uh, scared of mentions of the saints or holy things, and also Mary. And it's like, Hmm. So like a Bible-believing Christian that says, I reject all that stuff as pagan superstition. What's really going on there? The Catholics can say, you're possessed with devils. You're devil-possessed. We need to exorcise those devils by, you know, putting you on the torture rack or maybe, you know, torturing you for a while. That's what they did in the uh, Dark Ages. Look it up. I'm not joking. So... Crazy. But let's go on to the next one. This is the third video here. Check this one out. Why smart? Because in order to have this case proceed as exorcism, you're going to have to have a complete physical examination of the person who believes that he is ex he, subject for exorcism because he believes something more than an ordinary illness, mental or physical, is having to him. Consequently, you're going to have a complete, sophisticated physical examination. Second, you're going to have a very sophisticated, complete psychiatric workup. Then once that's done, then you have another psychiatric workup by another completely different psychiatrist. So, two psychiatric evaluations. I find that interesting. 
And uh, when you actually look at the whole thing of Catholicism and psychiatry, there's a lot of things there with the exorcism and whatever else. It's the same kind of philosophy. It's kind of interesting. It's not your fault. It's not you that's a sinner. It's, you know, he says that in the video there. I mean, he says at one point, I'm not going to play this part here, um, but he says that, you know, it's not the person that's been, that has the devil in them, you know, the, the, he uses the term demon, but he says that the person that's demon possessed, they don't even know. They're not even aware. It's not their fault. Uh, that's not what the Bible says. Okay. And see, psychiatry is the same thing. Well, you might have uh, some uh, schizophrenia or you might have this thing that happened in your childhood and it scarred you and blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, you're an alcoholic because your father's roommate's cousin's mailman was an alcoholic or something. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Get rid of personal accountability to God is what the whole thing is about. But uh, let's watch the next one here. When you look at probably the most famous case of exorcism in the uh, United States in the last 50 years, this concerned a boy in St. Louis. It starts, the boy was in Washington, and uh, a priest, very imprudently, uh, went ahead and tried to exorcise this youngster without consulting the Cardinal Archbishop of Washington at the time. And uh, the priest was, shall we say, severely cut up by the young boy who broke a mattress, took a spring, and began uh, def defiguring him. Uh, he was then sent back to his diocese, which was in uh, St. Louis. And there an exorcism took place by a very wonderful holy Jesuit. The manifestations were not at the beginning of the uh, ritual, but in the ritual. You began hearing, let's say, right after the litany, uh, you began hearing noises, shouts. Uh, the mattress would rise from the bed, etc. Uh, the boy would vomit and expectorate and do all types of things onto the person who was being an exorcist or yeah, let me pause it right there that's going to be important for in a little bit here the thing of vomiting remember that okay because we're going to see a protestant exorcist doing the same stuff and the same kind of things happening okay very important to understand but isn't it funny that this catholic exorcist priest actually has the same uh thing happen to him that happened to the Jewish exorcists, the seven Jewish ex exorcists in the book of Acts, chapter 19. I find that very interesting. But let's continue. And listen to what comes out about this whole thing of exorcism. Okay? Listen. Because some of you I know are going, it sounds like the movie Exorcist. That's what this whole story is. is this story became the movie Exorcist. And listen to who wrote the script. The uh, people who were there, the Jesuit seminarians, all of whom are big, strong Midwestern guys, uh, almost football player size, who were literally, literally tossed around like ping pong balls. When you say tossed around, you just say they're near the, the lad, right? They're supposed to be holding the lad down, and you put the hand on, boom, you'd hit against the wall. Or another person would be hearing it and bang, he would go right against the floor. I mean, it was just incredible, the power of these demons. And they were on, you know, good, fine Jesuit seminarians. <laughs> yeah, these demons, they're powerful, and they were on good, fine Jesuit seminarians. <laughs> yeah, the Jesuits are good, holy people. Uh, no, they're lost. They're lost. I mean, where in the Bible do you see anybody that's saved being attacked by someone who's possessed with devils? You don't. Interesting. Let's continue. The priest who was doing it was simply covered with uh, excrement of all types, vomit, spittle, uh, and was cursed. The language was absolutely unbelievable that was used. And true cursing, I mean, the taking of holy things in vain, and not just vulgar words, but cursing. And 
that was going on when you had this quiet rite of prayer going on after the recitation of the litany. And immediately that happened with the showing of the crucifix. Out they went. This process lasted for, I would say, maybe 18 months before, in fact, the uh, demons were expelled. The process lasted for 18 months before the demons were expelled. Again, where's this stuff at in Scripture? It's not in there. You know, Paul said it this way, the, the woman, the young woman that had the spirit of divination, it says he, he commanded the devils to come out, and they came out that same hour. And these guys are supposed to be in the direct succession, of apostolic succession. They should have the same power. But they don't. Uh, they took an enormous amount out of the man who was the uh, exorcist, and he needed about six to eight months of rest after it. But he was a very wonderful person. It did succeed. And notice, the young boy did not remember a single thing that had happened. None. Uh, that's just strange what happens with exorcism. It takes place on a, on a person who is possessed, which means he has no recollection whatsoever that his body, mind, uh, facilities, whole, physique, etc., has been used by the devil. None. Which is a blessing. Because notice, this is to show the glory and the power of Jesus over this evil spirit. It's not to inflict or to hurt this particular boy or any person who is being exercised. Now you say, well, the movie The Exorcist by Bill Blatty, is that an exact replica? Because certainly that movie was based on this case. Bill Blatty was Jesuit educated. Bill Blatty was actually the uh, director of publicity for Loyola University. He knew Jesuits. Jesuits talked about this case. And he had this book written, The Exorcist. And the movie uh, was then done by Friedkin, who has a wonderful visual imagination and sort of heightened things. Hmm. So a, uh, a Jesuit wrote the script for The Exorcist? And he was the head of production for Loyola University? Jesuits making Hollywood movies. Hmm. Wow. You know, I get real sick and tired of people saying to me, you think the Jesuits are behind everything? You think the Jesuits are behind... Well, I don't know what to tell you. If you don't believe that. Sorry, I mean, you do the research and it's right there. It's just like... I mean, there's probably some things that the devil uses other people for, but, you know, the Jesuits are pretty high up on the list. But let's go on to the next one. Exorcisms, once mainly performed by Catholic priests, were usually done quietly behind closed doors. But that's not the case with some modern-day exorcisms. As Fox 6's Sherry Palmieri reports, one evangelist says he has performed thousands of them. Take a look. Of Almighty God, torment, I pierce you. You look at me, say, quit tormenting him. Get up! Get up and face the judgment of God. Get up. Get up. Get up! <laughs> Get out of the way, June. Just let the evil be there. June Kim came to one of Reverend Bob Larson's seminars for an exorcism. Who are you? Mm. Who are you? Mm. Your name? Murder, huh? Well, get up, murder! The 35-year-old who was repeatedly molested as a child by a family friend says demons have tormented her for years. <laughs> Rage would come out of my being. It's just not normal. I just hated myself and just really angry inside. The biggest cause of demonic possession in the Western world is sexual abuse. More than 50% of the people we deal with have been sexually abused, mostly women. How many generations murdered? How many? How many? How many? The history of exorcisms goes way back 2,000 years ago to the origins of the Catholic Church. Let me stop there for a minute. Because you see the news reporters, it's kind of funny because these secular news reporters are telling the truth. 
but you get this faker, Bob Larson, who's a Pentecostal preacher, by the way. And you can check out his channel. He has a, he has a YouTube channel. And he does these videos, you know, answering your questions. And the guy's dressed like a stinking Jesuit priest. I'm going to show you some rather, rather remarkable things about old uh, Bob Larson here, this Pentecostal Protestant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. But you see, this whole thing that this woman is doing and stuff, it's fake. Okay, these guys will use the power of suggestion. They're hypnotists. They will go in there and they Bob Larson. I'm not a hypnotist. I don't know how to do hypnotism. <laughs> he says that in another one of the videos that I watched of the guy. But complete faker. He's a fraud. If you want an exorcism, it costs you $500. Um, I'd be careful of anybody that does these exorcisms and deliverance ministry and stuff like this. I know Bill Schneblin, which I've talked about and, and been promotional of some of the stuff he's put out. I'm real careful about that guy now, to be very honest with you. I mean, he's going wingnut Hebrew roots and the whole thing and stuff. And, and you know, there's some major issues with that guy. And it's always kind of bothered me. What this? What's the deal with this? This exorcism, you know, casting out devils, all this stuff like this. There's some weird stuff. Okay, very weird stuff. But let's let's continue here. In those days, exorcisms were done more often because, as it was true in the time of Jesus, the word possession uh, was used for any sort of phenomenon that people didn't understand. Somebody who had an epileptic fit, for example. What's the link to the molestation? Did somebody molest somebody? Did somebody molest somebody seven generations ago? Yes, I know you can speak. Yes. Answer. The Diocese of San Diego refused to talk to Fox 6 about this topic, saying they didn't want to participate in anything that might cause them embarrassment. It's a topic that has the church split. In the name of the Father. <laughs> I think there's there's some division. I, I think there are very conservative Catholics who believe very literally in demonic possession, and there are many uh, more you know, liberal Catholics who think the devil is a symbol for the evil that comes from our own hearts. Okay, so you know, Catholic diocese doesn't want to make do anything that'll make them look stupid. <laughs> well, I thought that's kind of interesting, but you, you know, you'll see this difference of opinion within Catholicism. There's some priests that are like, it's fake. Others are like, oh yeah, it's real. We'll see that here as we continue. But weird. The Catholics are the ones doing this stuff. Let's watch the next video clip. Come out completely. Come out. Come out. I know it's you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I speak to you the peace of God, the comfort of Christ, the presence of Christ, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. I speak this over you now. Okay, now you remember what the Jesuit priest said earlier? He said that there's expectorant. They vomit when they're doing this thing. Bob Larson, the uh, Pentecostal, had that guy there with the tattoos. He was vomiting, and other people do too, just like the Catholics say happens. And you say, but, but brother, that's, that's what happened. Chapter and verse, please. The Bible describes devil-possessed people pretty plainly, I never read where any of them are vomiting. Okay? I see where they come and worship the Lord. Hmm. And a lot of these Bob Larson exorcisms, after he's done, he's like, okay, lift up, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And they're going, well, praise the Lord, I feel so much at peace. Yeah, because he probably just put devils in them. Impartation, not exorcism, is what's going on there. But did you notice what Bob Larson did to the guy's head? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Catholic. He's a Catholic. Absolutely. Let's keep watching. I'll show you some more shocking stuff here. I think this next one, I'll, I'll say about it when I'm done here. Watch it. 